This web clip provides a discussion of the ventral pathway of cortical visual processing. My name is Chris Baker, and I'm an investigator in the Laboratory of Brain and Cognition at the National Institute of Mental Health in Bethesda, Maryland. Before I begin, I just want to acknowledge the people who contributed to the work I'm going to present, in particular Dwight Kravitz, Salim Kadabacha, Leslie Angelida, and Mort Mishkin. The two cortical visual pathways are easy to see in humans with functional fMRI. For example, here I'm showing regions that are active when people perform simple tasks on visual objects such as a cow or a tree. Activity extends from the primary visual cortex in the occipital lobes of the brain, up into the parietal lobe, forming the dorsal pathway, and down into the temporal lobe, forming the ventral visual pathway. Here, I'm going to focus on the ventral visual pathway, which is thought to be critical for our ability to easily recognize and identify visual objects. Much work on this pathway has been conducted in macaque monkeys, and here on top of a monkey brain, I'm showing that the typical view of this pathway is as a series of stages through V1, V2, V4, TEO, TE, with projections into lateral prefrontal cortex. Two major properties of the neurons are thought to change along this pathway. First, the receptive fields of the neurons. The receptive field refers to the part of visual space to which a neuron is responsive. So in V1, we have very small receptive fields. These become larger in V2, larger still in V4, TEO, and TE, with some reports that the receptive fields in TE can be as large as the entire visual field. The second property is the selectivity of the neurons. Neurons in V1 are selective to simple lines and edges, V2 to conjunctions of these lines and edges, with the stimulus complexity increasing as you move along the pathway, until in TE you find neurons that are selectively responsive to visual objects. Now this view of the ventral visual pathway is as a serial staged hierarchy, and the combination of large receptive fields and complex stimulus selectivity is thought to give rise to position invariant object representations. Now here today, I just want to discuss three aspects of this pathway. First of all, I'm going to ask, is it really a serial staged hierarchy? Secondly, we're going to examine more closely the issue of position invariance. And finally, I'm going to suggest that maybe we should think about the function a little bit differently than just object recognition. To look at the question of whether it's a serial stage hierarchy, I'm going to focus on the anatomy, and particularly the anatomy in the monkey. So here, what I'm showing on the lateral view and ventral view of a monkey brain are all the areas that are thought to be involved in the ventral visual pathway. Here, I'm showing the superior temporal sulcus opened up so you can see all the areas in between. If we focus on V1 and look at the initial projections out of V1, we see that rather than just a simple projection to V2, we actually have multiple parallel projections to several different areas. Here, these arrows are shown in going one direction, but these are all bidirectional connections, meaning they provide input from V1 to, say, V3 dorsal, and back again to V1. If we now follow the connections further, we can see that we start to rapidly generate a complex web of connections that become more and more complicated as you come down the ventral pathway, involving areas on both the lateral surface and the ventral surface. So rather than thinking of the ventral visual pathway as a serial stage hierarchy, it's perhaps better to think of it as a highly recurrent and interactive network that progresses from occipital cortex down into temporal cortex with multiple routes of information processing. And understanding the role of all this recurrence and interactivity is going to be critical for understanding the processing that goes along this pathway. Second, position invariance. Here I'm going to use behavioral priming and fMRI to look at this issue. So although there are reports that receptive fields in temporal cortex and inferior temporal cortex of the monkey can be extremely large, if we look a little bit more closely, the story is a bit more complicated. So here I'm going to show some data collected by Hans Obdebeck and Rufan Vogels where they measured the receptive field size of neurons, in this case of neurons in the left hemisphere of the monkey. Here's where the monkey would be fixating, and here's the receptive field of one neuron. So the first thing to note, as shown by this example, is the receptive fields tend to be in the contralateral hemifield. So this is recording from the left hemisphere, receptive fields in the right part of visual space. Here's another neuron, which is again is biased towards this right visual field. The second thing to notice is that there's a great heterogeneity in the sizes of these receptive fields. So here's a whole set of neurons showing that they vary from being quite small to quite large. All of this suggests that in fact there's a lot of position information in inferior temporal cortex and maybe we shouldn't be thinking this is producing position invariant representations. To look at this more closely, I use behavioral measures to look at priming 
And also in um, fMRI, we use multivoxel pattern analysis to look at the nature of the representations. So first of all, what's priming? So imagine I ask you to name a given object presented in one part of the visual field, so this anchor here. And then at a later time, I repeat that same object. Well, the second time you see it, you'll be faster and more accurate to identify this object. And we can use priming to ask, is there an effect of changing the position of those objects in the visual field? Position invariance would predict that position does not matter. So what we did is we showed subjects a bunch of different objects in different locations of the visual field. We showed briefly presented objects for just 66 milliseconds here, which were masked, making this actually quite a difficult task. And subjects had to report whether they saw a real object, such as this one here, or a scrambled object, such as this one here. Now, when we repeated the objects, after roughly about 256 trials, we can repeat the object either in the same location in the visual field, a different location but in the same hemifield, or a different location and now in the other hemifield, and ask what is the impact on our measure of priming. So here I'm going to show the difference in performance measured as D' prime, which is a form of uh, accuracy measurement, between the second and the first blocks. First of all, we'll look at control trials that were not repeats. So people were slightly better in the second block, showing they actually just generally improved on the task. However, importantly, when objects were presented in the same position, they were actually much better. And this difference here refers to the priming effect. The question is, what happens now when the objects are presented in different locations in the visual field? Well, when that different location was the other hemifield, we saw no evidence for any priming. And even when that object was in the same hemifield, but in a different position, there was no effect um, observed in the results. These findings suggest that the representations that are being primed are position-dependent representations. We followed this up with fMRI, and we took a subset of the objects that were presented in the priming experiment, 24 different objects, and presented them to subjects in the scanner in, in each of the four different quadrants of the visual field. Now, to look at the responses, what we did is we, we focused on areas in the ventral visual pathway, and we extracted the pattern of response across that region. So here what I'm showing is the pattern of response to the anchor in this left upper visual field. Each bar here corresponds to the response in individual voxel, and you can see that across this whole area there is a particular pattern of response. And we can ask, is that pattern of response unique to the objects? And so here I'm showing the pattern of response to a helicopter in the same location, and you can see that it has a different pattern of response. Comparing response patterns in this way has been referred to as multivoxel pattern analysis. Now, on top of asking questions about different objects, we can look at the effect of different positions in the visual field. So here we have the anchor in a different location in the visual field, the helicopter different location in the visual field, and here I'm depicting what you might expect if these were position invariant representations in this area, where the patterns are actually very similar despite changes in the visual field. So what we can do is use these patterns to say, is that pattern specific to the object? Can we use the pattern to discriminate between the different objects that were presented? Well, first of all, if we look in the contralateral visual field and we look at the same position, we can actually determine above chance which object was presented at a given time. However, if there's a change in the position, even within the contralateral visual field, we lose the ability to do the object discrimination. And in the ipsilateral visual field, we can't discriminate between the objects at all. This is very consistent with the monkey data that I showed you earlier, where we had receptive fields largely confined to the contralateral visual field and with a range of sizes suggesting loss of position information. So again here, using the fMRI, this suggests that there are position-dependent representations even in anterior stages of the ventral visual pathway. But wait a minute, don't we need position invariance to be able to do object recognition easily? Well, actually, there's two things to consider. First of all, that we have a behavioral solution to the problem of things appearing in different locations of the visual field. We move our eyes. Object recognition is largely a function of the fovea, and so we move our eyes to objects that we want to identify. Secondly, if we still have position information, even at later stages of the visual pathway, this is going to help communication between regions by providing a common language, that if they all maintain position information. Finally, let's just quickly address the function of the ventral visual pathway. So to do that, I'm going to look at the outputs of the pathway. So there are, there are a number of different output targets. And here I'm showing a schematized um, lateral view and ventral view of the monkey brain. And there are a number of subcortical targets, including areas of the striatum, both the neostriatum and the ventral striatum, as well as the amygdala. There are projections to the medial temporal cortex and hence into hippocampus, projections to orbitofrontal cortex, and projections to the ventrolateral prefrontal cortex. Now, one thing to note about all of these output targets 
is they all are all involved in learning and memory, things like habit formation, emotion, long and short term memory, reward and value. And so maybe since these outputs probably provide the raison d'etre for the ventral visual pathway, we should think of the ventral visual pathway as serving to capture the stable properties of the world. And this is not just object recognition, but any properties that are stable in the world that may be useful to be associated with things like reward and value. So overall, what I hope I've shown you here is that although it's convenient to think of it as a serial stage hierarchy, that's not really what the ventral visual pathway is. And we need to understand what this recurrence is really doing. It doesn't really produce position invariant representations. And in terms of function, we should think of it as being there to support the representation of the stable properties, the quality of things that are in the world. Thank you for listening.